And now for our special guest, a man that founded Ross in 1972, who was willing to come to Phoenix for our 45th anniversary, Ken Ross. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Very impressive. Yeah. It's a flame of excellence. Michelle, honestly, you're going to have to pay security. <laughs> okay. But it does say, Ken Roth, founder of Roth, 45th anniversary, 1972 to 2017. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. I, I wasn't nervous until now. Now I'm nervous. I'll be, I'll be a little silly. Uh, I want to thank everybody that invited me, Jill and Jack, I spent some time talking with them about, uh, about the early Ross, and, and so uh, uh, I actually founded Ross in 72. I left in 88 when the company was acquired, so I had a great 16-year run, but I actually haven't had any association with Ross until now, so it's really great to be back to celebrate this 45th anniversary. Uh, and one other thing I'd add that, that uh, and I, I texted my, my wife last night, but it's very strange to walk around here and see my name bandied around all over the place. <laughs> so before I start, I have three questions just to give me a sense uh, for the audience and give you a little preview of what I want to do. First of all, how many of you have heard of Digital Equipment Corp? Yeah. Yeah, maybe half of you. Yeah, okay. I'll talk about what all this means later on. How many of you, of you have heard of uh, financial modeling in the old sense? Just a couple of people. And how many of you have heard of computer time share? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, again, when I talk about the old days of Ross, I'll try to break this so all become clear to you. Uh, so before I start the presentation, I want to show you a video that I drudged out of my, uh, my computer from an old VCR tape, a three minute video that we made at, at Ross in uh, 1983 or so. You'll get a sense for the company. So, can I do this myself here? Or do it? One more. We are Ross Systems, and our business is financial software solutions. Ross Systems was founded in 1972 as a consulting firm, helping financial managers get the most out of the computer and computers. Over the last 12 years, as computer technology has changed, Ross Systems has become one of the leading suppliers of integrated financial networks. For a world where today's accounting data drives tomorrow's strategies, Ross introduces integrated software, combining important management, accounting, and planning capabilities. The MAPS family of software products. What makes MAPS so unique? <coughs> Today's financial manager needs both accounting applications and decision support tools, and he needs them to work together. Each MAPS product performs a powerful independent function, but can share data formats and support with other MAPS software. So instead of a package of discrete unrelated parts, the financial manager gets a dynamic integrated system. And for the accounting power you need, Ross offers MAPS GL, our fully interactive general ledger and financial management system. <laughs> Developed by a big eight CPA firm for today's changing business environment, this package incorporates a financial database, ad hoc report generation, changing organization and reporting structures, and consolidations of dissimilar charts of accounts. MAPS GL is the financial manager's window into a complex financial picture. Supporting MAPS GL is MAPS AP, Ross's interactive accounts payable software. Interfaced with MAPS GL, MAPS AP handles cost accounting, purchasing, and commitment tracking to form a complete software accounting system. Whether you need high-level mainframe, easy-to-use personal computing power, or extensive data communications, Ross is the solution. Maps Model, GL, and AP are all available for on-site use on Digital Equipment Corporation's VAX computer. And our recent introduction, Maps Pro, designed exclusively for DEC's new professional 350, 
brings the power of Maps Model to the personal computer. All Ross products are also available through RossNet time sharing services. Located in a new data center in Palo Alto, California. Our seven DAC, VAX, and PDP-11 computers are accessible from virtually anywhere in the world via our district office's dedicated lines and our interconnections to the three major switch networks. Mainframe, micro, or mini, on-site, or via time sharing. Ross's distributed computing ensures that the right amount of computing power is applied to the task at hand. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of the computer industry in the early 80s. It was not as sophisticated as, 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 it, as it is today. But just the agenda, I want to talk about the actual beginning of raw systems, how I started it, what I think of as the, the time sharing era, the first era of raw, uh, our trans transition to ERP, which is basically when we transition, uh, that's the start of the raw ERP, sort of as you know it, the buyout. And again, I think some of the common success factors that made the old, I'm going to call it Ross Systems, that's the old Ross, and the Ross ERP, why they're both so successful. I see a lot of commonality. So uh, just a quick uh, update on my background. Let me try to get organized here and I can see it okay. So I graduated from MIT in 1965 uh, and Stanford Business School in 1967. I studied a number of uh, courses in, in, in computer, but there was really no computer science curriculum back in those days. But I was fortunate enough to have a number of summer jobs uh, to learn about computers, including two summers uh, at IBM. So after I uh, earned my, M uh, my MBA, my first job was at, at a, as a financial analyst at a company called Raycom in, in uh, Menlo Park, California. Stands for radiation chemistry, not relevant today, but it was an early Silicon Valley startup. Uh, after about a year as a financial analyst, my <coughs> boss must have seen some potential in me because he promoted me to be in charge of the IT department for finance and, and uh, payroll systems. That's where I really got my start with computers. Just on a personal note, I live in San Mateo, California, which is 20 miles south of San Francisco. Uh, I've got five children, three, three grown children, and two that are now, I want to say not grown, but they're in college, so I guess they're grown too. Um, so how did Ross Systems start? I wish I could give you a definitive answer, but I actually had a burning desire to start my own company before I turned 30. Today, in Silicon Valley, this is, is normal, and actually 30 would sound sort of old for people starting companies. Uh, but in 1972, it was considered pretty average. Everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, didn't have a business plan, plan, I didn't have a product. So I started out on my own. Uh, I solicited consulting projects. I did uh, some system design work, did some coding. You know, just out basically hacking around. And then the name, My Raw Systems. Uh, and somebody might think it's because I have a huge ego and I wanted to name the company after myself, but in fact, those of you that either know me, may have met me, that's not the case at all. I actually spent quite a bit of time aggressively searching for a computer sounding name that made some sense. But in 1972, there was no internet, and so you had to write letters to the state of California. It was a screwy situation, and finally, because I'm very impatient, I sort of said, to heck with it, I'm just gonna call it Lost Systems, and it's done. Uh, so that was sort of an interesting thing. Okay, time sharing. That was the first era of Ross Systems. Uh, and serendipity played a huge role in the evolution of the company. Sometime in 1974, we actually landed a consulting slash programming job uh, to build a budget model uh, on, a, on a system called General Electric Time Sharing. And I'm not gonna really dwell too much on the time sharing business, but time sharing was basically people use terminals like a teletype terminal uh, to access beta and applications on a remote computer. Uh, sound familiar? Yeah, I right know. Uh, I think today's, with today's cloud computing, we've really come a, a full circle. So the project led to Ross's first product in our leap from consulting to timeshare. I decided that we could develop a financial modeling language, which thinks predecessor to spreadsheets. So this was 1974, 1975. Uh, and, it, and we could offer it on a new class of computers, mini computers, 
that were being offered by Digital Equipment Corporation. And a key, a key part of our strategy, which was pretty different then, was a large company that timeshared our software and spent a lot of money with us to choose the option, which is to actually buy their own computer and basically run our so we'd sell software and run it in-house. So that was a little bit different, and it was a pretty good competitive advantage to a lot of the other time-sharing companies, which sort of locked you in uh, at a very high price. Um, so we sold our first product in 1976 to, you know, it's interesting, a lot of the companies that were lost customers that I'll talk about are no longer in existence. So we sold our first product to a company called Crown Zeller Bot Club, which is a big pulp and paper manufacturer. That was 1976. And that made Ross one of the first companies to sell a business application product, uh, standard business application product uh, to a company. Now everybody calls them apps, but we used to call them applications. Uh, I mentioned Digital Equipment Corporation. By the uh, mid-1980s, it was the second largest computer company in the world. Uh, we had a large data center in Palo Alto, which you saw in the video, seven computers, uh, people accessed by dial-up modems, Originally, people would dial up. I think we got it to about 330 characters a second. That's really bad, 30 characters a second. And I think it, you know, the next technology was 120 characters a second. These are, all of these were pretty much uh, teletype types of terminals other than, you know, we finally got the VT100 VT terminals later on. And they used our products to develop financial reports, budgets, and uh, all sorts of other kinds of information. So let me uh, get organized here. This slide doesn't seem in the right sequence. Ah, okay. So, uh, so here's here's a financial model. So this is a very simple spreadsheet that you see, uh, and and uh, it's a brochure actually from 1975. If you look up at the upper left hand corner, you'll see the actual date that this was printed. Here's the code that generated that, and I'm, this computer language that was a row column formatter, I actually wrote myself in basic. Uh, and it was, you know, it looks pretty simple here, but I'll talk about some of the customers that use this in, in, a, in a second. Uh, so, take a look at the customers that use this to do almost all of their financial planning and accounting. And you'll see, you know, Apple computer, uh, Intel, Wells Fargo Bank, which is Intel on here? Yeah, that are, that are all in existence. Uh, there's a lot of companies here that probably don't exist anymore, but we had a great customer base and we could talk about you know, how that base relates to you guys in a, in a little while. Uh, the other thing I want to do, I don't know how this got a little bit out of sequence, uh, but it was sort of interesting to me. I volunteer at the Computer History Museum. Well, look at our timeshare pricing. I think this is an interesting thing that, that we sold timeshare at uh, uh, $12 an hour and 22 cents a CPU second. And if you look at that red arrow down at the bottom, we rented this store at 24 cents per block of storage for zero to 6,000 blocks. And a block is 512 characters of storage. I mean, that was, uh, so if you like, take this out to the extent there's about two million blocks in a terabyte, so our effective rental price was four hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars per terabyte per month in nineteen seventy-five dollars, i.e., two point four million dollars a month in two thousand seventeen dollars. And for my daughter, I just went down to Amazon and bought a one terabyte this drive for fifty dollars. <laughs> uh, it shows you the power of Moore, Moore's law, and it's a talk I give at the Computer History Museum. Uh, anyway, it's kind of interesting, but. Our pricing was actually quite low at that point in time. And, uh, okay, so uh, let's say the transition. So, uh, our time sharing business was going really well at that time. It was highly profitable. It was like a SaaS business. We had AR, we didn't call it ARR, but we had ARR, we had recurring revenue. Uh, but trouble was brewing. This was 1979 ish. 1979, Apple introduced the Apple II and a startup called Software Arts introduced a new product called VisiCal. Anybody remember VisiCal? Yeah, okay. That was the first spreadsheet. Uh, 1981, IBM introduced the PC, and then uh, Lotus 123, a much more powerful corporate-oriented spreadsheet. 
So the advent of, of personal computers and spreadsheets really uh, spelled the demise of, of uh, computer time sharing. Uh, so fortunately, through a series of serendipity encounters, we were in, we came across a very sophisticated COBOL-based general ledger system that was developed by Price Waterhouse. Uh, you know, Price Waterhouse was uh, a, one of the big eight back then public accounting firms. It was then merged with Coop, Price Waterhouse, Cooper's, Cooper's Library, and now it's been acquired by IBM some years ago. So we began a skunk works. Uh, this would have been early 80s. Uh, to create a mainframe class VAX ERP suite based on the general ledger. This was COBOL based and there are some people in this room that I talked to last night that actually use the COBOL based system. We introduced the general ledger product about 83, 84 and it's the beginning of the Ross ERP as you guys know it today. Uh, now, let's see, going back on the slide here. So we had a transition problem. Uh, uh, it was very difficult that I'm going to talk about, but you can see that the, uh, the, the, the blue graph shows our software revenues and the green graph shows our time sharing revenues. And the, the transition from one to another was a very complicated uh, part of time. Difficult, it took a lot of years. It was challenging to develop a whole new product family and a whole new business model. Uh, uh, we, be, you know, we began with a general ledger, and we also found very few companies willing to acquire a general ledger product without all the other complementary apps, accounts payable, purchasing, accounts receivable, etc. As a result, we realized we needed to build out a whole family of products. We couldn't make a business just with a single product. Uh, the transition was difficult for other reasons. Our time-sharing business was very successful. We had a recurring revenue. It was profitable and it was ingrained into the culture of the company. Convincing people, our team, and motivating them to sell products was an arduous process. We had a great sales and marketing team, but they were experienced and comfortable selling timeshare. So developing and standardized accounting products to sell for on-premise, and I, in my speech I put that on quote because in Silicon Valley, on-premise is, uh, is uh, not the most current thing, as you can imagine. It was an entirely new business, so we had to learn the hard way. Very few people had done it at that point in time. There were not a lot of software companies then. We had product bugs, competitive pressures, financial pressures, many other hurdles to overcome. I sort of likened it to the proverbial person that's thrown into the pool to, to, to learn to swim, to either sink or swim. And fortunately for us, and maybe fortunately for you, we, we learned to swim. Uh, and, and the other thing that was either, uh, we were very smart and very lucky that the Digital Equipment Corporate Corporation and the VAX matured very quickly. The whole trend in computing was to move to decentralized computing, departmental computing, divisional computing. So the mini computer business became very successful and our products were able to ride that wave. Uh, we, we actually, had decided to focus on that. So our products only ran on Digital Equipment Corporation computers, and that allowed us to leverage the many thousand strong debt sales force to sell our products for us without any worries that, that, that somebody might choose a product from, let's say us, but they would decide to buy an HP or IBM mini computer. They knew if the company chose our products, uh, they had to buy it with the debt tax. So that paid off really well. And that was really rolling into the into the mid and, and late 80s. So I thought I was going to say a few words about the software industry itself uh, in the early 80s uh, as part of this. And, and, and uh, 35 years ago, uh, I characterized it as the wild west of software. And I'm not really, we didn't really have any experience with PC software, but we had a lot of experience with enterprise software, software, software for companies. Uh, so some of the things that I remember, you know, first of all, and I know there are a lot of controllers and accountants here, but uh, accounting rules were very loosely defined back then, especially with respect to revenue recognition uh, for software. Uh, people always thought about delivering, shipping physical products. So to sell, to sell a product, we actually had to ship a physical magnetic tape. There was no downloading of software. Uh, we could recognize revenue when we physically shipped the tape, shipped the product, 
And there were a lot of issues with public companies back then, a lot of revenue recognition issues, and a lot of abuses of, uh, of, it, of, of issues with big companies. I actually ran into a friend of mine the other day from a company called Informant, an early database company, and they ran into some pretty significant uh, revenue recognition issues where, you know, I think somebody went to jail on that. Uh, the software development process was similar. There was no testing tools. QA tools, libraries, open source code. I mean, basically, to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your development team, you, you either, you know, you, you did the that or you tried to develop your own kind of product. So, uh, there were no sales and marketing apps, no CRM systems, no remote demos, no PowerPoint, uh, nothing like that. Uh, our salespeople did a lot of traveling and then made extensive use of something that's becoming rapidly obsolete, which is voice telephone calls. Uh, I think we began using voicemail in the early 80s. And uh, the last comment, which I won't elaborate on, but the HR, uh, human resource personnel practices in the industry would, would be considered bar barbaric by today's practices. Uh, so we had to innovate in the 1980s in all of these areas, and we were fortunately innovative and nimble enough to become a leading enterprise software application vendor back then. So, let me just move on. I, don't, I guess I'm probably doing okay at time. I know I, I talk fast when I get nervous too, so I'll slow down a little bit here. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the buyer. By 1988, we had a great run. Our business was profitable, debt was phenomenally successful, uh, and things were growing great. But as I said before, trouble was brewing again. And, uh, you know, that's the problem when you're in the software industry, you know, you have all these different kinds of transitions and they're very difficult to deal with. Uh, the PC had grown to be a strong force in corporate computing and people were talking about substituting client-server architecture for mini computers. So anybody remember client-server architecture? So that's really where people were going to have a front end, a PC connected to a mini computer, a mainframe, and that was going to be the next architecture. In fact, that was the enterprise architecture of the 90s. Uh, it was, I'd always seen one transition in computing from, uh, from time sharing to software products, and uh, I really didn't have the interest or the energy to try to go through that whole process again. It's, uh, it's hard. So in the early 80s, in, the, uh, in 1988, we were approached by Dennis Bowes and Pat Finley. I know a lot of you know them. Uh, they were former executives of an Atlanta-based accounting software company called MSA. They decided they wanted to buy the company and get into the next wave of computing, which they thought was going to be a mini-computer company. But I, I knew better than that. So uh, the end of November 1988, the buyout occurred, and I, I left voluntarily leaving. There's nothing I, I wanted more than to get out of lost systems and have the flexibility to go on and do different things. So I was a very happy camper. Uh, so I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about why the, my lost systems is so similar. What are the similarities between that and Ross ERP group? And you know, not only did I have a great catch-up session with Jack and Jill on the phone a couple of months ago, but I learned a lot last night talking to many of you who are customers. Uh, and I thought that was a great, a great learning experience for me. And uh, I tried to sort of come up with a little bit of the similarities and maybe some differences. So I know a lot of you are from what I think of as, you know, everybody not mid-America, but I think of many of you, mid-America, manufacturing, vertical, food and beverage industry. Um, the Ross Systems, which, which I started, began in the heart of Silicon Valley, and it was mostly focused on high-tech companies uh, with some financial services thrown in. That was our low-hanging fruit. Uh, we had to find customers that were early adopters of technology, willing to put up with the trials and tribulations and, quite frankly, the foibles of a new business. Uh, and I imagine that this is a pretty different environment from many of you that you experience today. You probably like the Ross that's that's proven, it has all of your functionality, uh, great support, uh, and products that probably have, maybe, no bugs, now I'm sure you have some bugs, but few bugs. Uh, so that's sort of a different environment. But I, but when Jill and Jack talked to me, and then when I, I talked to all of you last night, this whole concept of 
of the customers being a close-knit family came through loud and clear. And that to me is so impressive. I mean, again, in Silicon Valley, everybody's talking about customer success, customer success. There's now metrics about customer success. But, you know, it's true. Having happy customers is the first way, most important thing to being successful. And uh, obviously, I've seen that in spades here. Uh, the, and I can see that the Appian company had such a strong commitment to customer success. Uh, if you were to ask me why Ross Sisters was successful, I would have said exactly the same thing. Focus on long-term customer success. Create great products for customers so they can solve their business problems. Somebody last night told me the same thing about the Ross ERP group. Solving your business problems, don't worry about the latest technology. Close communication and building a strong team, sales, marketing, finance, and engineering. So I think, you know, that those factors sort of relate the old Ross to the new Ross, and that's, uh, you know, pretty interesting to me. So uh, just another quick history about what I'm doing today, and then I will uh, close. So Ross, the Ross sale occurred in uh, 1988, November of 88. Actually, I consulted for a year after that as an interim CEO for a couple of companies, one of which turned out to be fairly successful, called Documentum. I don't know if anybody's heard, <coughs> anybody heard of Documentum. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a big, uh, it's now owned by somebody else, but I became the CEO of a, of a uh, pioneering company in enterprise budgeting. It was called Pillar. And Pillar was end up, ended up being acquired by a company called Hyperion, which ended up being acquired by Oracle. So, you, you know, I, you know, you know uh, some of you know Hyperion, okay. Uh, so that was uh, 1995, and you know, I'm a, I'm a Addicted entrepreneur in 95, 96, I, I founded a new company called Extricity, which was a pioneer in the B2B internet business. Uh, it was a, a company that created technology to automate business processes between different companies. Think supply chain. Uh, that was a pretty successful company. It got acquired by a company in uh, 2000 called Peregrine Systems which went bust. It was a company that abused the accounting rules terribly. But luckily, I, I got out before that happened. Uh, in 2000, I left to join the venture capital community. I, I joined a venture, cap, venture capital firm headquartered in New York, run by the former chairman of American Express. And I opened the Silicon Valley office of a company called RRE Vent Ventures. I left in 2005, so I was there for about five years. Two years, I was an interim CEO again in a, in a, in a bunch of screwy industries, an embedded systems company. Unix embedded systems were different kinds of devices and a gaming company. And then back to being an entrepreneur. In 2007, I founded a social networking company called Expert CEO. And we did that for about five years. It was a, a, a company that tried to create, that created a forum for CEOs to interact confidentially confidentially with their peers, to share problems with their peers. Uh, it was very successful, it had a lot of users, but we closed it in 2013. Back in those days, it was highly successful except for one minor thing. Great service, but people don't like to pay for that kind of service. And it just, you know, it got to the point where we said, and of course when we sent out the notice that we were shutting it down, they went, oh, try, 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 we love the service, yada, yada, yada. Nobody went to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my wife was my partner, and, it, and she was, it was, it was interesting. So, lastly, what am I doing, lastly, what am I doing now? I, I like consulting with young entrepreneurs, small companies. Uh, I'm a part time angel investor, and I'm part retired. And some of the companies I'm working with, it is, I have a nice, interesting, different variety of companies. A company called Recti, which is a recurring billing system based on the Oracle platform. Company called Pinfoil Security, which is a, a DevOps security company that scans apps before they get pushed to production. Company from Peer Insight, which is a machine learning for voice recognition and meetings. Aptimize is a mobile development company. Mscripts, mobile pharmacy, and health. And I'm trying to improve my golf game. <laughs> uh, unsuccessfully. So, but just in closing, I want to say a couple of things because. I love coming back here. I know that, uh, I mean, this was a huge opportunity for me. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not hard work at all. And I, uh, I'm very fortunate to have been involved in the software industry almost from its beginning. Uh, I've worked with a lot of interesting companies. More importantly, I've been 
fort lucky enough to meet and work with great people who have really become lifelong friends. I still see a lot of the old Ross people that work for me. I still am friends with them. I, I play golf with them, and they show up almost everywhere I go. And I'm actually very happy and proud that Ross continues to thrive. I mean, it's very strange to think 45 years ago when I was starting Ross that I'd be standing here 45 years later and Ross would still exist in some, in some fashion. Very few companies, I think, make the claim that they lasted for 45 years. I mean, actually, I'm sure there's not very many at all. Uh, I think it's also exciting that there's so many loyal, happy customers and the product's great and, and, er and everything's to be working. Uh, I actually, my two children at Stanford studied computer science. Uh, one of them is a freshman, so she's just getting going, but my son's a, a junior and he's been at Facebook and he's been at Google. And I actually send them links to the Ross ERP stuff occasionally to prove to them that dinosaurs like me actually know something about the computer. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for the privilege of speaking to you today. I'm going to be here till Thursday morning. I'm going to hang out like I did. I'm going to try to attend some of the special sessions. And I look forward to hearing uh, more from you and talking to more of you in detail. Thanks a lot. Probably need to know introduction. Yep.